Hi, good morning. Welcome back for another lesson this week. We are going to continue our story of King David, and it comes out of the book of 2 Samuel, chapters 11 and 12. And this morning, we're going to pick up right where um, King David has been king for a while. He's been um, successfully on the throne. He's adored by the countrymen of his nation. He's looked up to by the other kings surrounding um, Israel. He is successful in all the battles that he fights. He's realizing that God truly has blessed him and his country. And um, as David continues to, to reign and to be successful, we learn, though, that being popular and being su successful can start to be a stumbling block for us. They can cause us to, to fall and to get prideful. And that's kind of what starts to happen with David. You know, he's really successful. God's blessed him. And he starts to look at it like, well, I did all this. Or, um, well, now that things are going good, I can maybe start to have some more fun. And one of the popular customs at this time of kings was usually that they could take multiple wives. And that's something that David started to kind of take part in. He started to have multiple women and multiple wives in the palace. And um, this time, instead of wanting to take his army into battle against the Ammonites, he sends his general Joab. He tells Joab to go, I'm going to stay here and just continue watching over the, the city. So um, he does that and he stays back at the palace and one night David goes up to his rooftop deck maybe to get some fresh air and he might be able to hear the um, hustle and bustle on the streets. Um, he's looking at just how big his city is. He's looking over the people and there's something that catches David's eye <clears throat> while he's up there and he sees a beautiful woman while he's up there and he doesn't know who she is but he realizes she's really pretty and I kind of want her for myself. So he summons his servants and he starts asking questions. Who is she? What's her name? Where is she from? Where does she live? Those kinds of things. And they come back with the answers. He discovers that her name is Bathsheba. She's married. She's married to a soldier in David's army. The soldier's name is Uriah. And David still decides, I really like her. I think she's really pretty. Uh, bring her back to the palace for me. And so they do. They bring her to the palace and she ends up spending the night. Now, David wakes up the next morning and he may feel a little guilty, um, maybe a little fearful because he realizes that he just spent the night with a married woman of another man and that act is called adultery. I mean, and that's a sin. God tells us that we on, are only supposed to have one man and one wife um, and we're not supposed to take that of another. So he has committed adultery, which was a sin against Uriah because it was his wife, but it was ultimately a sin against God because David disobeyed. So David doesn't really think anything of it. You know, he kind of thinks it'll blow over. Um, nobody knows about it. And, you know, no one is going to discover that this was a one moment weakness and temptation. Well, a few weeks later, he gets a message from Bathsheba saying that she's going to have a baby and that David is the dad. Because remember, Uriah is off at battle. So he wasn't home. Now, David starts to really get fearful and he really maybe starts to feel guilty and he might panic. You know, sometimes when when you do something that you know is a sin, you know you should not have done, maybe you lied, and somebody starts to kind of figure that out, and he starts to panic, you know, maybe your hands get a little sweaty or you get butterflies in your stomach. That's kind of maybe what David was feeling. And now he was trying really quickly to cover up his sin. Remember, he's still trying to contain it so nobody finds out. So he reasons that if Uriah comes home and spends the night at home with Bathsheba, no one's going to figure it out. People will just assume that the baby 
will then be Uriah's. So that's what he does. He writes a letter to Joab, and he tells Joab to send Uriah to the palace. And Uriah has no idea what's going to happen. He has no idea why he's coming back to the palace. And so David disguises Uriah's presence at the palace for wanting to have an update on the battle, what's going on. And when Uriah gives him a brief update what's happening, David just tells him, you know what, you're home, you're in the city, why don't you go home and sleep with your wife, spend, spend the night at home before you go back to battle tomorrow. So Uriah turns and leaves, and the next morning, David is maybe quite surprised when he hears that Uriah didn't go home and sleep in his bed. Instead, he s slept by the front gate with the servants on the ground. And when David calls Uriah back, he says, what is this? Why did you sleep on the ground by the front gate and not in your own home with your wife? <clears throat> and Uriah says, sir, I couldn't. I thought too much about my countrymen and their sleeping situations. They're sleeping on the ground. They were in battle. They're dirty. They're tired. They're sore. And they're sleeping on the ground under the open sky, I could not go home and sleep knowing that they were out there fighting. So David reasons with Uriah again, and he brings Uriah back later that night for a big feast. And David's plan this time is to get Uriah drunk, and so drunk that he will forget all about his countrymen and their sleeping situation, and that he would go home and sleep in his bed. But Again, much to David's surprise, the next morning, he wakes up, and again, Uriah slept on the front steps by the gate with the servants of the palace. Now, David was really starting to panic because he's tried twice to cover up his sin, and it just isn't working. So now, David feels he needs to take extreme measures and try to cover up his sin. And he writes a message to Joab. <clears throat> And he tells Joab, put Uriah at the front line of the hottest battle. And when you do that, withdraw some of those men so that it would be easy for the Ammonites to kill Uriah. And that's what happens. Joab does that. He obeys King David. And he writes back to the palace saying, it was done. Uriah is now killed. He's dead. The Ammonites killed him. I did as you ordered. So David, he might feel a, a little sense of relief. Like, whoa, good, that's, that's over. Now my sin will never be discovered. It's never going to be found out. It was one moment of weakness that I gave in and no one's going to discover it. But here's the thing about sin. Um, first of all, the Bible tells us that our sin will be found out. It will be discovered, whether it's um, by us by somebody else, um, it will be revealed. And sin kind of has this way of snowballing. You know, you do one little sin, it doesn't seem so bad, and then, and then you do it again, or you do something else, and it's a little bigger, but you, you still try to make it okay, or you still try to cover it up, and it kind of just grows and grows and grows, and it's a big, but like a big just stumbling block that we're constantly going over, and we don't feel good. You know, our conscience our knows that we did wrong. The Holy Spirit continues to move inside of us. It makes us feel so guilty. And those are some of the things David was really wrestling with. But here we are. Uriah is dead. He's killed. David committed adultery by sleeping with Bathsheba. And now he's guilty of murder because he sent Uriah to the front lines and had him killed. And Bathsheba is mourning the loss of her husband <clears throat> and she has the baby and she's alone and David waits now for the mourning period to pass and he's able to then take Bathsheba to be his own wife and he thinks that it will all be okay because now that he and Bathsheba are married together and she has this baby maybe he starts to think well, people will just now see Bathsheba and I are married and we had this baby and things will be okay. But God has given David chance and opportunity again and again to
to confess his sin and to ask for forgiveness, and he has not done that. Instead, he's continued to try to cover it up himself. And now it is time for God to act and to judge David for the sin that he has committed. And by doing that, God sends a prophet named Nathan. And at this time, when David is talking with Nathan, he still thinks nobody knows about his sin. He still thinks it's covered up. And Nathan tells David a story. And he tells him a story about a very rich man who's got lots of sheep and lots of cattle. And then he tells him, in that same story, there's a poor man that only has one sheep. And that poor man loves that sheep. He adores it. He treats it with respect and kindness. And he feeds it well. And he takes care of it. And it is that poor man and sheep, they are a family. And one day, the rich man with all the sheep was going to have a big feast. And he was too selfish to sacrifice one of his own sheep for the meal. So he takes the poor lonely sheep of the poor man and sacrifices that as the meal. And as David is hearing this, he's thinking that this is a true story, that this is happening in his town. And he tells Nathan, surely whoever is doing this must die. And then his family must repay the poor man with more sheep. And Nathan looks at David and he says, sir, you are that man. And in that moment, in that split second that Nathan says that, David just crumbles to the floor. He realizes, my sin has been discovered. Oh, because see, in our story, the rich man is David, the poor man is Uriah, and the lamb is Bathsheba. And David just crumbles with guilt and repentance and anguish and sadness at what he has done, like it's finally free for him to confess and to get it off his chest. And this is what Nathan tells David as part of God's punishment. He says that the sword shall not depart from your house because you have done this. Your wives will be given unto your neighbor. Evil will rise up against you and come out of your own home. And that reminds us out of the book of Galatians. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, a man shall also reap. So that just reminds us in our story that we have consequences for the actions of our sin. And David is mourning. He's grieving. He's repentant. And Nathan tells him, Even though you are sad and you are repentant, God will still forgive you of your sin, but there is still going to be a consequence. And that consequence then is that the baby born to Bathsheba is going to die. And David goes into a a moment or a, a time of prayer of forgiveness, confessing, He's praying for the Holy Spirit to stay with him, to continue to fill him, to bring back that joy, that love that he had for the Lord, just for the Holy Spirit to stay with him. And when he hears that the baby has died, David goes into a period of mourning. He changes his clothes. He takes off his clothes. He changes them. He goes to the house of the Lord, that is the temple, and he prays for the Lord to um, to stay with him, to continue to bless him, continue to use David to further his kingdom, to be um, a good steward of God. And he writes in the book of Psalms just how sad he was. He expresses it um, in one of the Psalms that he writes. He continues to ask God to be used for his purposes. And that's what happens. God forgives him. He continues to love him. He continues to bless him. In fact, we go on to learn that David and Bathsheba have another baby, another baby boy, and they name him Solomon. And he is going to be the one to continue to advance God's kingdom. And he's going to be the one in which the family of Jesus comes from. So here are some questions for you. 
Number one, how did David sin? Remember that was way back at the beginning of our story. What was it that caused David to stumble and to sin? Did God know David sinned? Even though David thought nobody else knew about it, did God still know that he had sinned with Bathsheba? How did David try to cover up his sin? How did he try to keep it a secret? Did God leave David in his sin? Did he leave him to feel guilty in it and to wallow in it? How did Nathan get David to realize that he sinned? How did Nathan get David to realize that his sin had been discovered, that God still knew he sinned? What does David's sin show about his heart? Was God still good to David? And all of this at the end, after David confessed, repented, and asked for forgiveness, was God still good to him? And then what was special about the second son with Bathsheba, the second baby boy that comes that's a blessing? Um, what's so special about that second son? We'll talk about that again in the coming weeks. But in the meantime, I hope you <clears throat> have a good week, and we'll see you here next week. Bye.